This is a message for, not for good times. You know, when things are going well, and you've got plenty of money, and, and your job's secure, and your family's doing good, and the schools are teaching what they ought to, you know, it's pretty easy to be a Christian. But I'm telling you, I believe the time is coming very soon, maybe months, is not going to be so easy to be a Christian. You all know that they are demonizing, if I can use that term loosely, they are demonizing conservatives and Christians as being domestic terrorists. They're setting us up for the people to believe it's better to kill us than to let us go. This is coming. I'm telling you it's coming, and it's prophesied. You read Mark. Jesus said, Mark 13, I think it is, he says, uh, they will kill you, thinking they're doing God's service. This is coming. I've held this, I've carried this message for a lot of years, but it's never been preached, but now the Lord says it's time. And I'm telling you, the things that have come against me today about this message, the enemy does not want this out, because this message may save your life someday. The third reason that I think that it's not being preached is because it's simply misunderstood. I did a little research on that particular passage that we're going to get to here in a minute with other versions of the Bible. And what I discovered was, is almost every modern version of the Bible changes the key word in this whole section to say something other than what it says. And when you, when you read that, you'll completely miss the point because of that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in detail a little later. So if you don't have and haven't been used to using a King James Bible, and I'll talk more about that. I'm not thumping for the King James specifically, although I much prefer it. I'll tell you why in a little bit. You would never know what this is really saying. And so it would seem like it's not an important message. Why would I preach on it? Why would I teach on it? And so those three reasons, I think, one of those three reasons is the reasons I've never heard a message on this. But you're going to hear it this morning because it may one day save your life, your eternal life. Have I got your attention? Your curiosity's up? Okay, let's go to the verse then. Let's go to the verses. It's in Luke. Luke chapter 7, um, around verse 17. It's also in Matthew, but we're going to read it in Luke because there's more detail there. If you got your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to that and read along with me. Okay, I'm going to get a running start at this to kind of set the stage. Um, Jesus has just uh, raised a man from the dead. John the Baptist is in prison, okay? So that's kind of the setting. I'm going to get a running start and back up to uh, verse 15. Luke 7, verse 15. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. So this is the setting. And there came fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea, and throughout all the region round about. My mouth is not working like it usually does. <coughs> Here's where the story really begins. And the disciples of John showed him all these things. He's in prison, okay? They, his disciples came and was telling him all about what Jesus is doing. And the disciples of John showed him all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you he that should come? Are you the one? That's the title, if you didn't notice that. Are you he that should come? Or do we look for somebody else? Do we look for another? And when the men were come unto him, Jesus, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto you, saying, Are you he that should come? Are you the one? Or do we look for another? And so, instead of answering them right away, and in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the, deb, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. And to the poor the gospel is preached. And then he said, And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. 
What? What's that got to do with anything? Now, this is a really strange story. Think about this. This is John the Baptist. This is the guy who the Lord told him what to look for. And he said, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and landing on him and staying there. The Lord told me I was going to see that and I would know that's the one. This is the one that Jesus came to and said, baptize me. And John said, Lord, I need to be baptized of you. This is the one who John was standing on the shore with his disciples and Jesus was walking along the shore and he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And those disciples that were John's became disciples of Jesus. What's going on with John? Why is John saying, are you the one? Or do we look for somebody else? What happened? Well, you've got to get a little bit of background to understand why John's feeling this way. John, you understand, knew the book of Isaiah. And, of course, Jesus knew it also. And Jesus also knew that John knew the book of Isaiah. See, John knew who he was. He knew he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. They asked John who he was. Are you the Messiah? Are you that prophet that's supposed to come that Moses talked about? And John said, no, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He knew who he was and he knew the book of Isaiah. Now, there's a couple other verses in Isaiah. Isaiah 30, you can get these verses from me later if you want to write them down. Um, I got them here so I can read them out really quickly. Um, of Isaiah 35, 4 to 6. I've been so stressed out about this, I have to calm down a little bit. <clears throat> Isaiah 35, 4 and 6, it says this. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, and he will come and save you. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Does that sound familiar? Then for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Now you begin to understand Jesus' answer. He's saying, are you the one? Jesus is saying, he went first, he went and did these things. I can't see you with my glasses on, and I can't see my writing without them. <laughs> Jesus was doing these things. He was causing the blind to see, and the deaf to hear, and the lame to walk, and all these things. And so he's giving this answer to John, basically saying, see, I'm doing exactly what Isaiah said I was doing. Right? So you see why he answered him this way? But there's another verse in Isaiah. And it goes like this. This is Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant for the people, for a light to the Gentiles. And this is, these are prophecies referring to Jesus. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. What's, what's not happening to John? He's sitting there in prison. He's been there for a while. He knows this verse. Where is Jesus? And that's why he's saying, are you really the one? It's written right here that you're going to do this. You know, Jesus never opened any prison doors, literally. Metaphorically, of course, he's doing it all the time. You understand? And these things can be seen metaphorically as well. We all know that. But he was literally healing the blind. He was literally making the lame to walk. He literally doing these things. But one thing he was not doing literally, he did not open any prison doors. And John's saying, okay, are you the one? Now, you notice in Jesus' answer, he never mentioned that part. Why do you suppose that was? Because I believe Jesus knew John was not going to get let out of prison. In fact, he was going to get his head cut off. Jesus knew this, I believe, by revelation. doesn't say that, but I believe he knew it because of his answer after that, the key verse. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. See, at first glance, that does like, what? 
well, what's that got to do with whether you're Jesus or not? That doesn't make any sense. But he knew John was not going to get let out of prison. Now, I'm going to take a little sidetrack here because the word that is mistranslated so much is the word offended. I, I looked it up in some other versions of the Bible, most of the modern versions. And this is a beautiful example. And you have to forgive me. I'm going to get on my soapbox here for a minute, my King James soapbox, if you'll forgive me. King James isn't perfect, but I still think it's the best English translation there is. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I looked it up in like eight or nine different uh, versions of the English Bible. And they said things like, blessed is he well, that shall not fall away. Blessed is he that will not doubt me. Blessed is he that will not lose faith in me or find me a stumbling block. It doesn't say that in the original language. The word in the original Greek is offended. And that same word that's used other places in the New Testament, which I'll read you some examples here in a minute, is always translated in the King James anyway as offended. And every place you see the word offended in the King James is that same Greek word. But modern translations, and when I say modern translations or modern versions, and not all translations, a lot of them are just paraphrases. And a paraphrased Bible, if you don't know that, is just somebody else's opinion of what it says. It's really a commentary. But modern translation, I mean, or modern version, I mean any Bible that's been published within the last 200, 250 years. <clears throat> and I say that because... If you do your research and you study, I, I watched a video once about how the King James Bible came about. I think it's called The Greatest Book on Earth or something like that. I don't remember what it's called. It's on YouTube somewhere. And when I watched this thing, how it all came about, I cried at the end because the authors of the King James Bible had as their purpose, their goal, was to make as accurate one-to-one -one translation as they could from, an, from the original language into, into English. Now, if you've studied any other language, you know how difficult translation is. And I've talked a lot about language and words, but because not always, there's not always a one-to-one -one correlation between a, one word and another, and you have to sort of interpret a little bit, but they tried as hard as they could just to say what it said and leave the understanding of it between you and God. Now, I have read the motivation of most modern translators or modern versions of the Bible. Usually, they are written to make it easier to understand, right? That's their idea. But if they're making it easier to understand, whose understanding are you getting? You're getting the understanding of the authors of that version. Now, the Holy Spirit can overcome all that. My first Bible was not a King James. But over the years, I've, I hear people read from other versions in Bible studies and so on, and I'm reading, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that, that really doesn't seem to capture it. It really changes it. The Holy Spirit can make the difference, but you understand when you read these, the word is, blessed is he who's not offended. They said, fall away, doubt me, lose faith in me, find me a stumbling block. You look at that and think about that a little bit. These are all things that could come from being offended, see? But the authors of this decided, well, this is what he really means ultimately, so this is the word we're going to put in this Bible. So if you have a modern translation that doesn't use the word offended, you've missed the whole point because it's not about, I mean, think about this, blessed is he who does not fall away. Duh. Of course. There's nothing great about that. Why would I preach on that? That's just like common sense. But the whole point is offense. Offense is a doorway. It's a potential doorway to these other things. Offense can lead to falling away. It can lead to uh, losing faith in him. It can lead to finding him as a stumbling block. But if you don't understand that it begins with offense, you've missed the whole point of what Jesus was saying here. Let me read a few more verses where it uses the word offense. Matthew 13, 21, it's in the parable of the sower, talking about the seed that fell among thorns. He's explaining what that meant, and he said, but when tribulation and persecutions arise because of the word, by and by he is offended. Doesn't say by and by he falls away, but that can easily be a doorway to that. 
Matthew 13, 57, when Jesus came to his own country and they knew him, um, they knew his family, they knew his mother, they knew his brothers and sisters, and it says, they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet's not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Excuse me. Matthew 24, 10, he was talking about the last days in Matthew 24, and he says, and then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. It starts with offense. Matthew 26, 31, just before his betrayal, when the, when the crowd is all there, or just before they're there, Jesus said to his disciples, all of you will be offended because of me this night. See, now that's an interesting thing about being offended. It's not necessarily permanent. You can forgive and the offense can go away. You can get new understanding of what was going on and you realize, oh, I, don't, I really shouldn't be offended. But offense is the doorway. And if we don't have this in our minds, when offense happens, we won't recognize it. Um, I'm not sure which way to go. This, this goes in many, so many directions that I, I want to... There was a... How many of you remember 9-11? That was 21 years ago. Some of you younger people probably don't know about that. But when 9-11 happened and they destroyed the Twin Towers, it was a shock to the nation. People were shocked. War always happens over there, not here. Over 3,000 people died. Church attendance went up dramatically for about three weeks. And then it began to shrink again. But the conversation about that event went on for months and months. It was the focus of everything. The whole nation was shocked. About four months after that happened, I was in my basement and I was watching, I was flipping through some channels on TV. Now, back then, I almost never watched TV, so it was a rare thing for me to be doing that. But I was down there flipping through some channels and I came upon a program, uh, basically a bunch of, it was talking heads, different people sharing something, and it was about 9-11. And I thought, oh, I wonder what this is. It's kind of interesting. And as I watched, and more and more people giving testimony, I became aghast because the whole premise of the program were, was people of all walks of life, pastors, rabbis, uh, ministers of all kind, people of all different walks of life, sharing about how the events of 9-11 had destroyed their faith in God. How could a loving God allow this to happen? You see, they didn't understand that side of the gospel. God is good. Don't ever get me wrong. God is good. And he loves you and he wants you to have a wonderful life, but you have to stop and think about what he means by that. God has a perspective of eternity. Uh, here's the... the crux of the message. We're going to share a couple things after this, but here's the crux of what this message here is saying. What was Jesus saying to John? He's saying, blessed is he that's not offended in me. When things don't go the way you think they're supposed to, when things don't happen the way the pastor has told you they're supposed to happen, when things don't go the way it's written, he will open the prison doors. Are you going to be offended? You see, when life's going good and it's been easy, and it has been really easy for us in this country. As Christians, we've been enjoying a lot of peace. I mean, we may have a little stress when we watch the news and so on because we see what's going, but it hasn't gotten there yet. It's getting there, but pretty soon, things are going to get really crazy. What if somebody snatches one of your children and kills them because you're Christians? God wouldn't let that happen. Would he? Blessed is he who's not offended in me. You see, you don't understand from God's perspective. He sees things through eternity. He's, he exists on both sides of death. Death isn't a terrible thing to God. He understands our pain and loss, don't get me wrong, but he understands what the other side of death is like and what it is. 
A death without him, of course, is horrible because he's con- a person is condemned. But, but no, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Everybody goes there from, by their own free will. They choose that because they don't want anything to do with God. This is a little, I won't go off on this too long, but you understand hell is a specially created place that God made where he is not. It took a miracle to do that because he's everywhere and everything. I mean, it's beyond space and time and all this stuff. But hell was a place he created where he is not. It's a black hole. And, and when a person decides, has been praying, I don't want anything to do with God, God says, okay, it's your choice. I've made a special place where you can be without me. But you understand, if he's not there, there's no light, there's no love, there's no communication, there's nothing. It's total darkness. All you are stuck with is your own conscience, your own regrets, your own grief. The worm dies not, regret. The fire is not quenched, grief. You don't share that with anybody in hell. It's, you're absolutely in darkness. There is no such thing. That's a little bit of a rabbit trail, sorry. But that's what God created. He created that special place to answer the prayer of those who don't want anything to do with him. Believe me, you do not not want anything to do with him. <laughs> I hope I said that right. Hell's a terrible place. Um, so, so this is something you have to really work on because we're so used to just being told and taught about the good side of God. We're, being, we're used to being told about all the promises in the Bible. I think somebody said once there are like 300 and some. I don't remember what the number is. 300 and some promises. But let me, let me tell you a little truth that you need to get a hold of. Not all the promises are for everybody. All the promises are for somebody, and it may be for you, certain ones, not necessarily all of them, but all of them are for somebody, and some of the promises are for everybody, but not all the promises are for everybody. How many of those promises did John the Baptist get to enjoy? What about Stephen? He died at a young age. He was stoned to death. I mean, Jeremiah 29, 11, that's a pretty popular verse. Does some of you know what it is right off the head, right off the top of your head? It says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Oh, now think about that. He's thinking eternity, not necessarily here. A lot of people claim that verse, they read that verse, they say, God wants me to prosper, God wants me to be, have a wonderful family, a wonderful life, no evil in my life, nothing bad's ever going to happen. Tell that to John the Baptist. He didn't want to die. He was in his early 30s. Stephen didn't want to die. Jesus didn't want to die. Did you know that? This is another little sidelight. I keep going off on these sidelights. But Jesus had his own will, and it wasn't the same as the Father's. Did you know that? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus had his own will, and it wasn't the same as the Father's. Oh, my gosh. That blows my mind sometimes. But you see, Jesus never did his own will. You, we don't even know who Jesus was, sort of. I mean, we know he had this great character about him. He was a man of deep character because, you see, he never did his own thing. He always did the Father's thing, so we wouldn't even know what Jesus' own thing was. You follow me? But he had his own thing. It was in there. He had his own will, and it was different. You see, but he, had di- he died to it. He had to die to it. He's not asking you to do anything that he didn't do. He's asking you to die to your will, just like he did, and live to the Father's. That's not easy, especially if he's calling you to stuff that you don't want to do. Lord, I want to be a missionary over in Africa. The Lord says, no, I want you to raise these three kids because I got some use for them as well. Lord, I want to raise these three kids. and say, No, I want you to leave them with another family that I'm going to take care of, and I want you to go to Africa. That kind of thing happens all the time. Are you going to be offended? Are you going to be offended? John 10.10, 10, the thief comes not for to steal 
Uh, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. Was that promise for John the Baptist? Now, now, I'm not saying you're John the Baptist, okay? That promise might be for you, and he has his reasons in it. But you have to understand every life's unique, and God's purpose in your life is unique, and you cannot take <clears throat> and generalize all the promises of the Bible and claim them for yourself. Now, if God gives you that promise and says, this is yours, claim it, hold on to it. You know what I mean? But if things don't go the way you thought they were supposed to go, the way it's been preached to you it was supposed to go, the way you thought the Bible said it was supposed to go. How about the rapture? I don't know where you all are, but there's a lot of people out there that believe that the rapture is the next thing to happen in the prophetic calendar. I personally do not believe that, and I base that on years of study because, you see, I was in the, I've been in church 50 years. For most of my walk, I've, I accepted the pre-trib rapture idea and the end times, the general picture of it, because I'm, I was never taught anything else. But I kept hearing this guy over here, has a, he thinks it's different. He thinks it's maybe at the end. Or this guy thinks it's in the middle. And it's like there was some dissension, and so that raised a question. Not everybody is convinced on this. Why is that? I want him to know. And I didn't trust anybody else's opinion, so I decided, i got to figure this out. And so I started a personal study in end times prophecy. Um, I lost my job at Rockwell at the time, Rockwell Collins, and I had nothing but time. So for about two years, for full time, that's all I was doing. I wasn't studying other people's opinions on it, commentaries and all this, although I am aware of some of that, don't get me wrong. I want to know, what does it say in here? And what does it not say? And long story short, after several things happened, I ended up writing a book. I have a book on end times prophecy. <clears throat> and you, <clears throat> I found many things that um, don't agree with what's commonly out there. One of them is the rapture. I am fully convinced, and you don't have to believe me, you know, research it for yourself. In fact, I encourage you to research it for yourself. That's what I did. Or read my book, and then you'll know. <laughs> the rapture occurs at the end, right before Jesus comes back. But the, the, I've, I've researched how the whole idea of the pre-trib rapture began, who originated it. It was a Jesuit priest back in the 1500s, the guy that originated the Jesuit priest order. I know the whole history of how it developed and where it came from and how it was propagated through Dallas Theological Seminary all over the United States. It's commonly believed by almost every church out there. It's setting people up to be offended. I've, and I've, I've had debates with people on this because I know the facts. I know what it says and they just will not receive it. It's something called cognitive, cognitive dissonance. You know what that is? That's when you have a belief that's very deeply held. You feel like you're convinced of this. You've got solid reasons for it. It's settled. I don't want to think about it anymore. That's settled. The rapture is settled. Then somebody comes along that has actually valid information that contradicts what you believed. And your mind goes, no. You know, dissonance is when two notes don't, don't mesh, mesh together in harmony. They, they clash. And it's, it sounds horrible. And it hurts. And their brain kind of goes, eh, 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 I don't want to hear this. I've got this settled. I don't want to think about this. I don't want to rethink this. Forget it. And in their brain, they literally, doesn't matter how much evidence you have, they just throw it out because it makes them uncomfortable. I'm telling you, this rapture belief that I believe is a false teaching is setting people up to be offended. It's setting, it's part, one of the things that's setting the stage for the great falling away. You're all familiar with the great falling away. This teaching today I'm giving you is very timely because there's many things coming that are going to cause you to be offended. In Matthew 24, 12, again, the, the, the chapter where Jesus is talking about the end times, he says, and because iniquity will abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's the love of God, not each other. The world will still love each other. But because iniquity abounds, the love of many will wax cold. He's, he's alluding to this great falling away. Uh, 
Paul talks in 2 Thess 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's talking about the Antichrist. But there are prophecies about a great falling away during those last days. In the middle of that seven years, somewhere in there. And I think part of it will be because so many people were like, I'm supposed to get raptured out. But suddenly when it becomes so clear and obvious that we're in the middle of the tribulation and that didn't happen, can you imagine the disappointment, the disillusionment? Like, well, if that wasn't true, what else wasn't true? I think it's going to be a major contributor to the great falling away. And it all comes from offense. Modern translations change those words. You'll miss that whole point. It's about being offended. How easily are you offended by God? When God does things in a way you thought, well, God wouldn't do that. I'm telling you, this is a warning. You see, today it may not be a big deal. But a month from now, when they come to your house and crash into your house and haul you off to jail because they think you're a domestic terrorist... You need to remember this message. You see, when, they, when, when Jesus told, tell John, blessed is he who's not offended in me. And John might have went, what? But when they came to his cell and picked him up and started marching him to the, the execution chamber, and he walked in that room and there's the chopping block and a man with an ax, not only did Jesus not come get him out of jail, he's getting his head cut off. Are you going to be offended? John, I could just hear that echoing in his mind. Jesus said, are you going to be offended at me? Are you going to let that offense cause you to fall away and all these other things? You have been warned. It's very easy to be offended when things don't happen the way you think they're supposed to. Christian, to Christians, to your families, to your loved ones. Remember this when it happens, because I believe it could be very near. The way the enemy has fought against me giving this message today, trying to discourage me in so many ways. I mean, when we, when we were getting almost done with worship, but suddenly John comes back and he says, are we set up to record this? I didn't know anything had been done. I guess something had been done. But I was like, oh my gosh, this may be their one shot. They won't get to hear this any other time. But I'm telling you, when it happens, this will come back to you. Jesus will come back to you and he will say, he'll ask you that question. Because you're going to get mad. You know, you're going to want to get mad at God. God, why, how could you let this happen to me? See, this is a, the uncomfortable side of the gospel. These are principles of the kingdom that we don't talk about because they're, they're not seeker-friendly. We don't like to hear this, that God would allow something like that. But see, he's not just allowing evil. You understand God is not thinking just of this life. There's something he's perfecting for eternity in a life that he allows these things to happen. You know, being part of, uh, associated with the martyrs is a very honorable position to be. Let me tell you another little secret. In heaven, you will not be glorified by what you've accomplished. I mean, your glory, your, your, there are degrees of reward. Jesus says that. He's talked about some, he says, great is their reward, which suggests there are some degrees of reward. There won't be any jealousy or envy. Don't get me wrong. None of that's going to be there. But the point is, in heaven, your reward is not going to be determined by what you accomplished. How many souls you saved, all this kind of stuff, because you didn't do that. The Holy Spirit did that. Your glory is going to be based on what you suffered on the price you paid, on what you sacrificed, that is your glory. It's the the holes in your hands, if you will. That is your glory in heaven. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Don't let offense cause you to stumble. This is timely. I'm telling you it's coming. I don't think many churches are getting messages like this because they're not very friendly. 